got two intros I'm going to do because we've got two amazing doctors here with us in the room today. And they are both joining us from UCLA Med Center, one of the best and most premier medical and teaching facilities in the world. I wanted to integrate health and wellness as a portion of today's agenda because I do feel like it is so important for all of us, especially as women, to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and our bodies. And as I told you about uh, myself in my introduction, this also has a very personal side um, to this uh, particular part of the agenda for me because of the struggles that I've dealt with. So like I said before, I want you guys to maybe not make the mistakes that I did earlier in my career and in my life and take care of yourself a little better than I did so you don't end up in the same spot. So first up, we're going to have Dr. Christina Charles Showman, sorry, medical doctor at UCLA in the rheumatology division. She received her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Yale University, wow, and her MD from UCLA. She's received countless distinctions throughout her education and medical career, including being the banner bearer for her graduating class at Yale. She was also selected by the dean's office to lead the processional at graduation due to her academic and personal achievements. At UCLA, she received the Department of Medicine Clinical Faculty Association Award of Excellence and was also a dean's scholar. And that was all just while she was in school. <laughs> she has received the UCLA Star for Clinical Care several years running and was either first or second place in the UCLA Department of Medicine Research Committee five years in a row. She's been invited to speak at more medical conferences than I could keep up with. She sent me about a 10-page long resume. She's published over 70 articles and abstracts in some of the world's most prestigious medical publications. And she is viewed as one of the foremost experts in the field of myositis, which again is my wonderful disease I deal with. And I can personally attest to her being one of the most caring physicians that I have ever met in my life. So just really quick, the first time I, I was diagnosed when I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I told you it was like, you know, big, big time in my career. Pepsi gave me a, a big promotion, moved us out to California. I can't believe to this day the serendipity of bringing Christina into my life. Um, but when I first reached out to her. She was recommended to me by someone else I had met who had the same disease that I do. And when I first reached out to her, I asked her, you know, will you take me on as a patient? An enthusiastic yes, first of all, which doesn't always happen. And the first time that we sat down together in her office, she spent two hours with me. I don't know if you even remember that, Christina. <laughs> But when was the last time anybody got more than a few minutes in their doctor's office? So to me, that was just the epitome of the, you know, the caring nature that she has and her desire, her personal desire to make this world a better place. So she's dedicated her life to researching this crazy disease, this crazy autoimmune condition. Um, she's... You know, I, I open up the myositis magazine that I get every month, and she's featured in there. Uh, I just can't say enough about what a wonderful human being she is, and I'm thrilled to have her here today. So thank you. And I'm also thrilled, as a part of this, she's also introduced me to one of her esteemed colleagues, Dr. Mahala Taylor. So we have them both here today with us. And through... Through the preparations for this event, I've come to really, really respect Mahela and the work that she's doing, particularly around integrative wellness. And so you'll hear a lot more around that. So she's dedicated uh, her research and her work to what they call integrative rheumatology, empowering patients to take control of their medical conditions and outcomes. And through that focus on integrative care, she's found a striking connection between mind and body and the devastating effects of stress and autoimmune disorders. In order to modulate the immune system and have long-lasting benefits in these chronic and challenging conditions for which we have no cure, she, has, she had to embrace very early in her career and in her work and her practice 
this idea of integrative medicine. So she's going to teach you all about that today. She, Mihaela, received her degree, medical degree, from Carol Davila University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Bucharest, Romania, and has been in practice for more than 20 years. She also has a list way too long to mention of all of her accolades, including receiving the Romanian Governmental Merit Scholarship, which is granted to, to the top 1% of medical students in that country. She's also won the Star Award for Patient Care at UCLA for several years running, as well as the Super Doctor Award for five years straight from 2012 to 2016. She has over 40 publications, countless speaking engagements, and has dedicated herself to doing biannual patient seminars focused on educating her patients and helping them to take control of their own health. She's been at UCLA since 2004 and has proven herself through outstanding, uh, as an outstanding cl clinical educator, having the skills and passion for patient care teaching and creative ac academic endeavors. And because of this reputation for excellence, she was recognized by her peers and appointed as the chief of rheumatology for the Santa Monica, Santa Monica uh, office of UCLA. She also works directly with the UCLA Center for East-West Medicine and the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center, which is a very nice compliment to what we're going to hear later today. So without further ado, you can shut me up now, please join me in welcoming both Christina and Mihaela up to the stage and give them a warm round of applause. They follow the pattern of the wind Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. It is such an honor, really tr such an honor and a pleasure. And I have gotten to know Mandy well over the years, and I just can't say enough about her. Uh, this is just such a wonderful event. Pleased to be here. So I am really here just as an introductory uh, few minutes for Dr. Taylor. This is her area of expertise, stress, and illness. Uh, I'm going to start off. Uh, well, as, as Mandy mentioned, I, I do split my time uh, between patient care and between research. Uh, I'm going to start off the lecture uh, with a case review, and it is a, a very typical case of the type of patient I see every week in clinic. Um, and then we'll, we'll introduce Dr. Taylor's lecture further. So this is Mrs. K. She was a 56-year-old, very healthy woman when I first met her. No past medical problems, didn't take a pill, didn't ever have a surgery. Uh, and in March of 2007, or 2012, excuse me, uh, she started with a little bit of fever, cough with clear phlegm, and saw her primary doctor, saw the doctor at urgent care, eventually got lots of antibiotics, um, but wasn't getting any better. And so about a month later, she started getting weak. Uh, she couldn't get out of bed very easily. And she started noticing a rash that was over her knuckles, her wrists, her elbows, and her face. Um, then she started getting a very itchy scalp and noticed some ulcers in her skin around her elbows and some scabs in her nose. And then her, her breathing started to worsen. And she couldn't go up the stairs in her house very easily because she'd get short of breath. And at that time, her doctors knew something serious was going on, so they would hospitalize her. Uh, she was seen by a lot of doctors and had several hospitalizations, um, but her diagnosis was unclear, and she was told she was the mystery. Uh, not a very good thing to hear when you're in the hospital. Uh, this is a CAT scan of the lungs, and it's not Mrs. K's, but it's about what hers looked like six months into her illness. Um, this, let's see if this pulls up, right here, the big glob here is your heart. That's a piece of liver. And this is all lung tissue. This is healthy black lung tissue. That's the way it should look. This down here is scar tissue and inflammation. It's white when it should look black like this lung tissue. Uh, these, right, 
there we go, right here are some lung function tests. The DLCO is the diffusing capacity in the lung for carbon monoxide. You can think of it as how much oxygen gets into your lung when you take a deep breath. And hers was 45% of predicted. You want 100%. The FVC is the forced vital capacity. You can think about that as your lung strength. And her lung strength at that time was 38% of predicted. And again, you want 100% of predicted. And that all happened in about six months. So March 2013, a year later, is when I met Mrs. K. She had been referred by her doctors to the pulmonary division at UCLA for evaluation of a lung transplant. Now, we're called best in the West, and we can do lung transplants, but the mean survival on a lung transplant is about five years. It's not a great thing. She was in a wheelchair at that time. Her family was performing all of her care, and the pulmonary doctor thought something else was going on, uh, and so referred her to rheumatology. That's when I met her. It's a little bit difficult. It doesn't show up so well, but her case was quite subtle. She has a little bit of pinkness over her knuckles here and here uh, that shouldn't be there. And she has some pinkness over her wrists, and she, you can see one of her little scabs over that wrist. This shows it a little bit better. Again, very subtle, and that's why it was missed. This pinkness that shouldn't be here, pinkness over these knuckles. And her cuticles were very dry and scaly. And that's when one of her ulcers over her elbow area and arm was healing. So she's not a mystery, she has dermatomyositis. It's an idiopathic inflammatory myopathy. What does that mean? Uh, it's an autoimmune disease, and what does that mean? That means the immune system, instead of attacking a virus or attacking bacteria, uh, it attacks its own, own body. And in inflammatory myopathies, it can attack the muscle, and it can attack the skin, and it can also attack the lung very aggressively in some patients. And women tend to get it more than males. Uh, it can occur at any age, even in kids. And the prevalence is said to be one in 100,000. I don't really believe that. I see new patients every single week with this disease. And I wonder how many patients uh, don't see me. Uh, it is associated with specific autoantibodies. Well, what the heck is that? You can think of them as markers of this type of disease. And we certainly need more markers so this disease doesn't get missed. Uh, she had a, an antibody called the MDA5 antibody, and that unfortunately is associated with rapidly progressive lung disease, which you saw in about six months in that CAT scan, and a very poor outcome. So what happened? Well, she came to see me, and we spent another two hours talking, and boy, did I have to negotiate. I told her all the different treatment that she needed, and she told me that I was wrong and that she had been through a lot of doctors and they had thought of all that stuff and other things. And uh, well, after the negotiations, she finally agreed and she started therapy with several different agents and the rashes went away, the strength improved and her breathing started to improve. And I saw her last month in follow-up, five years later. She's got minimal evidence of any disease that you can notice when you see her. She's still on medications, and she'll be on those for the rest of her life, most likely. But she feels 10 years younger, and she looks about 15 years younger. And she states that she's been given a new life. And those are her lung function tests there at the bottom. You can tell the FVC is now 67% of predicted when it was 45. And her DLCO is 55% of predicted when it was 38. And that's OK. Uh, with those lung function tests, she can live a very long life and die as a very old lady. So the introduction is for Dr. Taylor uh, to look at, does stress contribute to the development of, the Ill of illness, and how do we deal with that? Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, many of my own patients with inflammatory myositis, like Mrs. K, they recount significant stressors before the onset of their disease. And I commonly tell patients when I see them that I can give them all the medication in the world but if they don't take care of themselves and if they don't take care of their body with sleep, reduction in stress, all of these things, that medicine isn't going to work very well. And I mean that. Um, I think as a scientist, uh, my view on this is it's a very difficult area to study effectively, to prove that stress uh, is connected 
to illness. Um, but I think data continues to emerge that links stress to illness, and Dr. Taylor is going to talk to you about that. I took a crack at it uh, to look for scientific studies to support the link between stress and illness. And these are three articles. Uh, they're old articles, but they're very good. First one's from the New England Journal of Medicine. I think you all know that as the leading medical journal in our country. Second is from the Lancet, which is the leading medical uh, journal in Europe. And the third is from Circulation, which is the leading cardiology journal uh, in the country. The first one from the New England Journal looked at psychological stress in humans and susceptibility to the common cold. So this is 25 years old. You couldn't do this study currently. They took about 400 healthy people, and they gave them each nasal drops. And those nasal drops had five different cold viruses in them. Can you believe it? Hey, guys, sign up for the study. We'll make you sick. <laughs> Awesome idea, right? So great. Like I said, 25 years ago. And so then they, they quarantined the people, right? And at the same time, they gave all 400 people really heavy testing and questionnaires to determine their levels of stress in all different facets of life, financial stress, you know, psychosocial stress, all of these things. And then they watched them. And the patients who had the highest stress levels through these questionnaires were the most likely to actually get sick from the virus. That's a, a pretty nice study. The next article from Lancet looked at the association between psychosocial risk factors and risk of myocardial infarction. This was over 11,000 uh, cases and 13,000 controls. So they looked at the patients who had had uh, myocardial infarction and patients who hadn't, and they matched them in all sorts of way, ways. And again, they looked at questionnaires, extensive questionnaires of stressors. And they matched the patient and went back and forth. Uh, beautifully done study. And in fact, uh, stress was associated with risk of myocardial infarction. That's heart attack. The last study is definitely my favorite. This is over 50 years ago. Again, you couldn't do this study uh, currently. So it looked at changes in serum cholesterol and blood clotting time in men uh, that were subject, they call it here, cyclic variations of occupational stress. So blood clotting time, you don't want to have a fast blood clotting time. You don't want to clot, right? You don't want to have high cholesterol because those lead to heart attacks. And this study was done in 40 male accountants, 40 male accountants. And they drew blood twice a week in these guys for six months. And they monitored them more than that. And they looked at their stress. They looked at their diet so carefully, beautifully done. And what they showed is that right around tax time, yep, cholesterol went up. I mean, beautifully show they went up. The, the clotting time accelerated right around times of stress. OK, so does stress contribute to the development of illness? I'm a skeptic. I'm a hardcore scientist. And my summary is probably. Um, my take home point to you is don't risk it. You all look like very nice people. Uh, but I don't want to see any of you in my clinic, ever, <laughs> never. Um, so take care of yourself. Your body is your biggest asset, and don't take it for granted. This is Dr. Taylor. She knows the real stuff. Oh. Hello, everybody. My home message will be, not probably, surely, stress is the problem. <laughs> And I am not the investigator, I'm the clinician. So also I'm Romanian and I grew up in communist, so we don't trust what we are told. <laughs> so I am making my own observations. And uh, while observing in my thousands of patients that stress is a major part of their illness, I kind of embark on my own kind of discovery and try to implement simple lifestyle in my patients. And Long and behold, I was having amazing successes. So I started two years ago doing an integrated medicine fellowship with Andrew Weil at University of Arizona to bring the lifestyle changes that are validated and now documented through hardcore science into the mainstream practice, even at UCLA. <laughs> so is my uh, 50 slide deck ready? <laughs> 
talking about stress this morning. I'm like, please, Mandy, cut short the introduction. I have 50 slides here. <laughs> oh, I have to advance this thing? You can tell how technologically challenged I am. <laughs> but I don't let that be part of my stress. So what other disclosures I have? Um, I already told you and Mandy that I have been uh, for uh, 20 years seeing patients as, as a rheumatologist, particularly treating women, and uh, seeing so many numbers this morning here about women in leadership and such. I looked up and uh, in rheumatology, we treat 85% women because autoimmune disorders strike mostly women. And also I deal with a lot of chronic pain as well as fibromyalgia as that also very common in women. And I had to, again, observe, even if my textbook didn't teach me that stress affects the illness, not only that triggers, but also maintains and affects the course. Also, from personal experience, I have experienced burnout, and I continue learning to heal and to increase my resilience. So with all that said, I would like to share from uh, what I learned again, in my clinic and my personal life, that hopefully you will take home and you will look differently at your own life. And I don't have yet a life path. I need to kind of start my will today and <laughs> make a life path. I love to live in the moment. And um, even this being here, it's a, a serendipity. I never planned to be giving a, a talk on stress. But uh, now I'm even an expert in stress, the way Christina thinks. Okay, so let's see. Over 50% of Americans describe having moderate or high chronic stress, and 24% of Americans um, have stress-associated symptoms, irritability, angry outbursts, fatigue, lack of motivation, nervousness, who is signing up here? <laughs> <laughs> Feeling sad, upset stomach, muscle tension, headaches, and poor sleep. And we are an over-medicated nation because you can find over the counter any uh, remedy that you want to fight anti-acid, anti-depression, anti-this and anti-that. So it's like we are at war with our own bodies, unfortunately. That's kind of the approach that society has for us. And stress is associated with unhealthy habits. Not only the stress is stressful <laughs> to us, but we are going to pick unhealthy outlets to heal. And unfortunately, overeating, drug, alcohol abuse, tobacco use are just little crutches that we put there for dealing with stress. So hopefully today we'll uh, be uh, learning healthy ways and healthy outlets to cope with what is inevitable, stress. And why is it so inevitable? Because stress, it's basically our own unique personal reaction to anything that tries to change our environment, inside and outside. So it's prevalent, it's a part of us actually, and we have to deal with it. So you can see the uh, de uh, definition there that any condition that puts pressure and makes demands on the physical and psychological defense system of a living organism is considered to be stress. How uh, did um, this definition come into, or this uh, science come into existence? Hans Sely was a young uh, researcher doing endocrinology hormone research in 1936, and he was also a very lousy scientist uh, taking care of his mice in the lab. So he had um, an extract from uh, an ovary uh, from a colleague biochemist to be tested in his mice. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, he was very lousy at uh, uh, handling the mice and he was dropping them and he was chasing them, he was brooming them and stressing the hell out of these little mice. <laughs> so when he dissected the mice after injecting the ovary extract, he found that the mice had ulcers and also very large adrenal glands. And maybe you know the adrenal glands are the source of the stress hormones, the cortisol, adrenaline, or epinephrine. So he, as a good scientist, thought, okay, this is what the ovarian um, extract might do or might not. So let me have these other mice that I don't inject, dissect, and look at their 
stomach and adrenal glands and he found the same changes. And he thought, you know, maybe it's my handling of these mice, maybe my injecting and chasing them around that caused these changes in the body because it's not the ovary extract. So what he did, he started stressing them either through changing in the temperature to cold the way in the Western society we have this air conditioning, so we have ice in the water. Do not go after so many things today because I will not finish my presentation. He stressed them through a, a cold exposure. He stressed them through pain and all these other physiological stressors that he thought of. Of course, he couldn't necessarily stress them mentally, although uh, one of the models of stress is putting somebody in a loud, very loud uh, room. The mice with uh, noise are very stressed out. So uh, he found the same changes. So he concluded that we have innately in our bodies mechanisms through which we are responding to stress. That's kind of the way we evolved to survive. So he called that the stress response and he borrowed that from the physics, uh, stressing the metals until they break. That's the way they measure uh, you know, stress and resilience. And because everybody started associating stress with something negative that's being done or unpleasant, he also had to create a new word which was stressor to distinguish, uh, distinguish the stimulus from the response in the body. So uh, what our bodies then are trying to do to keep us in balance, not in balance, but in balance, uh, is to uh, react to the stress and afterward return to a baseline free of stress. And homeostasis is the long name that states we have to be in balance at all times uh, in considering you know, all these stressors that come and uh, challenge us uh, day in and day out. And we have, again, very adaptive through evolution uh, to systems that are trying to put us in our best to respond to stress. And uh, we also, we have embedded in us, and we'll talk about uh, later, the relaxation response. The problem is when one is off balance and it's overwhelming. Autonomic nervous system, everybody knows what's the autonomic nervous system? No, that's why I have 50 slides here. <laughs> because I was trying to give a lot of anatomy and physiology along the way. So we have basically, an autonomic nervous system, just like an automatic pilot, it's in charge of your trillions of cells um, uh, activities going on right now that you are not aware and you are not directly in control the way your gut is moving, your gallbladder is making uh, juice and all of these things. So this uh, autonomic nervous system has two parts. One part that puts us into the fight or flight is called the sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic is the one that kind of relaxes us and brings us base to baseline. That's called the parasympathetic nervous system. We also have the pituitary gland, maybe you heard about that, that makes hormones that um, basically modulate the adrenal glands and the cortisol, it's one of the biggest stress hormones along with adrenaline. So there is a neuroendocrine axis, meaning from the brain going into endocrine system, and there is this autonomic nervous system, both very major ways of, again, this innate, we are born, built in, wired in, uh, nervous uh, uh, stress response. So here, just borrowing from the Chinese uh, tradition, the yin and yang, that's the way uh, in this world of duality, our body also uh, works. We have uh, the autonomic nervous uh, system that when you are being stressed will make your heart beat faster, your blood pressure goes up. You forget about the digestion, you forget about peeing, everything shuts down there because you have to fight the, in the past, the, the tiger yeah, to survive. And you have to also uh, come back to baseline by activating the parasympathetic nervous system, just like an yin and yang, to maintain that balance. So in the parasympathetic uh, you know, response you have, again, you kinda, your heart a bit slows down, your muscle tone relaxes, your gut starts making you know, the juices and move along, and the same uh, the bl urinary bladder and so on. 
you have here again the neuroendocrine response where from again the brain going down through the endocrine system from the uh, hypothalamus, the pituitary gland to adrenal glands, you are mounting the cortisol, put out sugar, mobilize all this uh, energetic reserve to fight again the tiger. And uh, other, other things that are happening as a consequence of this mobilization here, again, you are breathing uh, you know, fast, the heart is fast, the muscle tense, the blood pressure rises. But if you keep going with this, of course, you run out of fuel. And uh, I was just talking with one of the participants this morning that was, um, you know, uh, in her 40s and her ovaries just shut down. And you can see there that when you are into that ongoing arousal that goes over, let me see where is that pointer, is that, okay, I'm going back in that ongoing arousal, you actually have too much uh, steroids, but you shut down your uh, testosterone, estrogen, and all of these other hormones that the body doesn't care about now because you are in this stress situation where you have just to survive. So what happens in the body in the acute stress, again, you have to survive. You are running away from the tiger. That's the way we, uh, over the evolution, uh, wired in this survival mechanism, you will have a shift in the attention. So you are very, very focused. Everything is flowing into the direction. You know, when you are in a high stress in meeting and you are at your best, the tennis player is in the zone achieving the best. That's all and wonderful in the acute situation. You also have improved decision making. So you are talking here about addicts, workaholics, like all of us here in this room, that enjoy that, you know, okay, I am at my best now, that rush of adrenaline. But um, unfortunately, you shut down completely your relaxation response, and you are going to get into this slippery slope here, where you were at your best with that release of the dopamine, adrenaline, and so on going up here, the curve, but if you keep going with this stress hormone uh, flowing through your uh, bloodstream and your tissues, you will come out at this uh, curve where you are basically depleted of all your resources to uh, cope with stress. So uh, basically, Sieli, uh, when he described the, the stress response, he thought that um, when you get on this slippery curve is because the actual sympathetic nervous system and uh, neuroendocrine system runs out of juices. It's not uh, necessarily true. It's actually the same uh, good response that you have it in short term becomes damaging to your health if you keep maintaining the same level of stress. So if you pick your cup of half full uh, yeah, glass uh, right now and maintain it there for a minute for me. Yeah? Can you do that? Yes, you have all of that. It's not about half empty and half full story what I'm going to say here. <laughs> so if you keep it there for a minute, you are fine. What about if you hold it there for an hour? How will you feel after an hour? How is going to be your arm? It will get numb and sore, yeah? And that uh, glass that was so light will feel so heavy. So the message I have here that it's the magnitude, not only the magnitude of the stress that we experience, but the duration of the stressors. And that's where we are going to get in trouble when we switch and we talk about uh, chronic stress versus the acute stress. If you have an acute stress and you can, I just, made this metaphor here. You see like you throw a pebble into the lake and the ripples there. The brain, let's say if this, it's a painful stress. Uh, the uh, body has checks and balances to confine that and go back to baseline. But if you are ongoing bombarding your brain in this case, but you can consider your body with stress day in and day out, you basically cannot go back to that pristine 
beautiful lake. You are just having these uh, waves and this ongoing restlessness and ongoing um, uh, upheaval that you cannot return back to balance. You had overcome your resources. So this is from one uh, book um, written by a physician that herself got very sick with an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, she basically portrayed very clearly we have resources and we have stresses and how that we can balance that. And look what are some of the stresses that, you know, uh, we don't even pay much attention. Poor sleep, it's a major, major one. If you do not get seven, eight hours of sleep, you are ready for imbalance. Uh, during sleep, we are basically clearing all the waste products that the brain accumulates during the day. So you have the spinal fluid flowing so beautifully and it's clear through the lymphatics only when you achieve deep sleep. If you are not achieving deep sleep, one of my colleagues call it, it's just like your house gets full of junk, the brain gets full of junk. All of those waste products are now being cleansed and you saw that everything when we talk about stress response starts in the brain. So we really need a healthy nervous system. Mental stress, water pollutants, processed foods. Processed foods are huge stress to the body. I can't emphasize enough how um, important it is to clean your diet in order to regain the balance. Sedentary lifestyle, we mostly sit. Maybe we should do a dance at lunchtime here. <laughs> because really, this is the new smoking. If you have not heard about the expression, sitting is the new smoking. And of course, we are bombarded with environmental toxins. So we have to eat healthy, exercise, uh, clean our environment the way we would clean our own body, uh, get enough sleep, at least seven to eight hours, have social support. You will see the science behind how social support actually boosts our immune system and have a meaning. And it's amazing uh, to be here today and see what uh, the meaning of uh, Mandy journey with her illness has brought her to bring you all together to learn something that will prevent you from getting in that sort of an imbalance that leads you to see one of us. And um, speaking here for my another 40 slides in 10 minutes, I don't want to repeat myself, but basically stress is bad for you. <laughs> and you can <laughs> see the science here. It leads to bad uh, behavior and impaired cognition and diabetes and metabolic syndrome through all of this releases, unbound release of stress hormone, the cortisol particularly, you know, the insulin resistant causes that deposition of fat around the waist. So that's a sign of imbalance in the uh, hormones. And um, we are going to talk about the impact on the immune system because this is what, uh, it's, uh, what I do every day, uh, talking about autoimmune disorders and uh, pain. So you can see here the same thing. We have many kinds of stressors from the emotional through the physical and just aging alone. And it leads to what it's more recognized probably as um, a corporate uh, heart disease. Um, I, even in my position working in the medical field was not aware that the number one cause of death in this country for women is heart disease. How many of you knew, knew that? I was thinking maybe cancer or, you know, dealing with autoimmunity. I knew that that's an epidemic as well, but it's still heart disease. And it's very important to recognize that uh, stress affects the heart and uh, the coronary disease, as Christina mentioned there, the plaque formation, the, the thrombosis, and uh, so on. Uh, Gut, gut uh, now is uh, being recognized as a major player in our health and um, uh, mental health and physical health. Mental health, you all know that 
you feel that butterflies in your gut, your intuition comes from your gut. Why would that be? Because we make more serotonin in the gut that we make in the brain. And also uh, we have uh, a gut microbiome, maybe you have heard about the good bacteria, that are crucial in how our immune system is functioning. So uh, we need to pay attention to this gut because with stress, you know, heartburn, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic constipation, that are the early changes, but after you can get to the autoimmune diseases, inflammatory bowel disease and such, and the stress plays a role with all of that. And the stress even kills that innocent bacteria that we have in the gut. If you can believe it, there is science to show that not only our poor diet, where we had cut uh, fiber from 150 grams of fiber our great-grandparents were eating, to 15 grams of fiber that we eat with the processed foods, and that fiber is what feeding these good bacteria. So what are they going to thrive and strive and eat? They will eat your own gut. So eat food that does not eat you <laughs> because it is real. There is leaky gut out there and it's caused by unfortunately not having this shield of good bacteria in our gut to prevent this new entity that we are talking about, leaky gut. So uh, more next time about that. Uh, stress and aging, of course, you know, we are all aging and that's fine. If we are aging gracefully and if we are feeling good in the bodies that we are aging, by the way, my definition of success, because I was talked this morning about success, it's the level of well-being. If you feel well where you are, you are successful. If you don't feel well, there's no success. Doesn't matter how many titles, how much money you have, what position. Well-being equals success. So the telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes and these two women scientists at UCSF, they actually got the Nobel Prize for describing the telomerase, um, an enzyme that uh, uh, lengthens the ends of the chromosomes there. They proved that in high stress environments such as caregivers, a mother taking care of an autistic son and other uh, caregivers considered to be high level of success, their telomeres are shorter. So the telomeres shortening, it's because of stress. So lots of science linking stress and disease. So now the challenging part for me is that I want to give too much information on the stress in the immune system and it may be more, uh, let's say, intuitive that yes, if you are stressed, your heart is beating here, sorry. I was beating on the microphone here, or you feel, you know, the butterflies in the stomach. So yeah, that's a direct impact of the stress. But what about immune system? How is the stress uh, affecting the immune system? For a while, for, you know, a long time, the brain and the immune system were considered to be completely independent from each other. So it took uh, decades, uh, even from uh, the uh, uh, original description of the stress response, to prove that the brain talks to the, your immune cells. And if you go to the traditional Chinese medicine, they actually have a very nice uh, metaphor about your immune cells. They can be happy, they can be sad, they can be angry, they can be frustrated. Isn't that nice? We are in Western medicine don't recognizing that. But that's probably what's happening with our immune cells. So here is some basics of the immune response where if uh, you take the immune system, and again, I didn't want to make any uh, warrior or war metaphors, but that came the handiest. <laughs> like an army that defends us from whatever is foreign that is coming uh, in contact with us. And Again, initially when I was making this slide for in, I was thinking a virus, like Christina example with the nose drops here of the virus, the cold virus, a bacteria or a cancer cell being foreign. But now I would like to add there the food. The food we are eating is foreign. It's processed. It's not recognized by our bodies as self anymore. So if the body encounters a foreign, let's say you get the flu, what is going to happen, this antigen presenting cell will take this foreign triangle here and present it to the T cells 
and this white part of the Y cells here, yeah, these T cells will say, okay, this is not good for us. Let's put out these chemicals, like a biochemical weapon that the army will release, the first line of defense, that is going to kill this foreign, but in the process will cause what? Inflammation. So if you have the flu, you have fever, you have chills, your body aches, your joints hurt, you have a headache. That is not from the virus. That is from the response of the immune system to the virus attacking the body. So that biochemical weapon is the first line of defense and it causes a lot of, you know, downtime and the employers don't like that. They want to snap back into action next day you are to work there. So we are now doing what? Taking over the counter, all kinds of things to suppress the inflammation. We also have, um, you know, uh, I don't want to come into the very, uh, uh, the dilemma of vaccinations, how much they help, how much they don't help, but we are also vaccinated in order for us to skip this part of the immune system releasing the cytokines. So I'm going the backwards or how? was I? Okay. So uh, we are going into the defense with the second line, which is the B cells here making antibodies, which are like a missile that goes after the foreign and gets rid of the foreign without making you feel sick. So basically when you get a vaccine, you want to have these B cells trained to the point where when you encounter actually the flu, you are ready to go into the defense. And this is a fantastic uh, machinery that we have, but as I mentioned in the process, you also release these chemicals called cytokines, like interleukin-1, 6, and so on, TNF-alpha, that are very damaging to the body. They cause inflammation. Now, if you uh, want to be really in an old track today, you need to know that stress causes the release of these chemicals without having to have that flu virus stressing you. So we are, through the stress, maintaining a high level of inflammation in the body. That's why I want to say that eating refined foods, sugar, and so on, it is causing stress and inflammation because this happens in the body. And why is, uh, what else is happening? These chemicals need to give a feedback to the brain to say, you know, now it's time to pull back. We need to retreat, just like an army. We went too far out there, let's get back. So what happens, this inflammation suppresses your immune system through this negative feedback going to the brain and releasing further stress mediators. So now it's becoming a vicious cycle. You have been releasing these chemicals to defend you, but now where is the offender? Where is the offense? It's our daily things we are doing to ourselves, mentally, physically, and so on. It's not anymore the flu or the cancer cell and so on. So we were managing now with ongoing stress to suppress our immune system. And unfortunately, if we take a step further, we can become dysfunctional to a point where the immune system cannot tell the foreign from self and start attacking self with the same weapons that was attacking the foreign. And that is called autoimmunity, where the immune system has lost tolerance to self. How about that? If you think about losing tolerance to self, metaphysically it's like you are not loving yourself. So I will not take that step maybe in my next uh, pa you know, life path <laughs> to become one of the love gurus. But really, I believe self-care starts with self-love. And basically there is a... Um, book out there called When the Body Says No. I heard from one of the speakers earlier that says, yeah, in that career I felt that my body said no, I have to change the path. And that is from Gabor Mate, a family physician in Canada who has made the observation that again, a lot of scientists will shake their heads and think he's crazy. But 
he states that in women, the autoimmune disorders can be triggered by repressed emotions, particularly repressed anger, not speaking up. Look how many of us we are in leadership position, not that many. So not speaking up, not taking you know, a stand. So it's an interesting point of view and I have been observing in my personal uh, practice with women what kind of stress brought them to their autoimmune disease or their chronic pain. So basically, everything that I said at the previous slide now, all these chemicals are being released in the body without the flu being present just because the immune cells now think that your own body is the offender and people with autoimmune diseases feel like having the flu every day. And again, not to, uh, you know, but I will repeat myself because this is very important. Uh, the genetics play a role, but the environment is major. And I put there stress, I should put sleep deprivation, smoking, infection, and vitamin D deficiency. If you take a message home to your doctor, check your vitamin D level, because that's very crucial for the functioning of the immune system. So basically, there is the weekend cold that doesn't require you putting the nasal drops of the virus in your nose because we have them anyway. We are all mothers exposed to everything and you know, working, uh, everybody comes sneezing and touching that keyboard. So we have the virus in us. It's all about how you mount the immune defense to the virus. And there is something showing that actually you will feel like having the flu just because you have been piling up too much stress and sleep deprivation, and that's called the sickness syndrome, and it's driven by those cytokines that we are talking, like the IL-6, and includes fatigue, somnolence, nausea, depressed mood, and hyper-responsiveness to pain. We start having neck pain and headaches and cramps and, you know, all of these things that you go to your Western uh, doctor and you may get okay, uh, you know, take some Tylenol or something over the counter, but unfortunately, you are not being told that look at your lifestyle because that's where the source of all of this is. And uh, look at the stress. Stress and pain, I will go very fast through these slides because basically, uh, just like with the other uh, things that uh, uh, affect our body when we go off balance, uh, we uh, are developing pain and it may be our scream for help. So now I'm thinking my migraines because I say, okay, you are telling me that I didn't sleep well, I didn't eat well, and I didn't take time for rest. So you can have that biofeedback that tells you, you know, it's time to slow down, it's time not, uh, basically you shouldn't ignore all of these symptoms and pain is a, a, a remarkable symptom of stress. So um, acute pain, it's good. You are again mounting that response of healing through inflammation, we just talked earlier. But when the inflammation is ongoing, uh, the pain becomes chronic. And there is more to the chronic pain than just you know the obvious. So like somebody, you know, that has deformed hands like this from osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. And it's not just the duration of pain that qualifies for chronic pain. What qualifies for chronic pain is the fact that now the original stress, let's say it was, you know, an injury, has gone out. You had the motor vehicle accident, you had a whiplash four years ago, but why is your neck now still hurting? And why do you, are you, you know, hurting all over, cannot sleep and so on? Because there is a component of the central nervous system of the brain that has uh, become part of the pain. And a lot of uh, patients that I treat with fibromyalgia, they just say, you know, I feel like a truck ran over me, uh, hurts head to toe, bones hurt, nothing helps. I cannot think, I cannot sleep, I'm exhausted all the time. You know, a lot of trauma psychological in the chronic pain. And it can be passed on trauma from generations. The epigenetics, which kind of is this new science looking at how you 
uh, express your genes. Some genes, you know, are sleeping, some are active. It's like a switch on and off that we have with certain um, uh, things that turn these genes on. They found in epigenetics that the uh, third generation of Holocaust survivors were bearing the trauma in their expression of the genes. So a lot of trauma is passed on from generations. So that's why there is not one uh, size fits all with stress, with pain, with whatever you want to, uh, to look at. It is your own unique way of you know, coping with stress, manifesting stress and disease, or staying healthy. Some people come with a lot of resources, some pe people come with very thin resources. So basically, uh, this fibromyalgia entity comes with a lot of past trauma that is battled down to chronic pain. But that chronic pain, if it is not looked at, you know, this is the surface in this big cake, we need to take layers off and see where it has started, you will never have success of treating that. And I tell them, you know, uh, in your 20s, you had this nice music playing, and after in your 40s, you start healing, feeling, uh, hearing this screechy noise. And what happens when too much of that noise accumulates 24-7? That's what happens. You become angry, you cannot think, you cannot sleep, frustrated. Yeah, and for these women that have in this some genetic predisposition, you start hurting all over. And it's interesting that one of the genes that uh, fibromyalgia phenotype wears, bears, it is an estrogen sensitive um, uh, gene. So it may uh, explain why, you know, majority of women with fibromyalgia have, um, majority of fibromyalgia patients are women. So lots of factors uh, when to we talk about disease are playing into the equation. Early life trauma, physical trauma, certain infections such as hepatitis C virus, Epstein-Barr virus, mononucleosis, maybe you heard about that, mono, parvovirus, Lyme disease, but also emotional stress. And I cannot stress enough the point that stress is causing disease. And um, basically, uh, yeah, this is a Frida Kahlo painting. I don't know if you saw the, the movie. I think she had probably lupus and fibromyalgia. All her paintings, you can see pain, pain, pain. She had that terrible uh, bus accident when she was little and was left with uh, chronic pain. You can see the arrows through her body. So now it's official, also for Dr. Charles, <laughs> that stress can cause inflammation of the brain. And fibromyalgia is a model, it's a very good entity to describe how psychological factors, which are very well recognized in that disease, plays a role, and how once your brain is inflamed, you are basically releasing all these chemicals from the nerve endings called neuropeptides that call, cause the diffuse body pain, the poor concentration, poor sleep, and so on, but also they activate the immune cells. And once they activate the immune cells, you are going, if you remember my, my slide with the T cells and the release of that chemicals that cause the flu-like symptoms with this, uh, you know, link in my opinion to autoimmunity. Because one in almost three patients with autoimmune disorders has fibromyalgia versus just 3% of general population. So that's definitely, in my personal opinion, a link between, you know, chronic stress, chronic pain, and autoimmunity. Again, I can stand here because you are no medical professionals and feel more free talking about that. If I go into my, you know, um, uh, office, uh, probably majority of my colleagues will not see the story this way. But wait 10 years. I'm usually about 10 years behind to give myself a little. Uh, 10 years before the, the, the science kind of follows uh, what I have been looking at. So, is psychological stress stressful? So, I think it is. What do you think? So, but let's don't go into the nervous breakdown. 
Definitely, uh, after Seeley in 1936 de described the stress as a normal response of the body through, you know, physiological, more obvious stressors like the temperature changes, the painful stimuli. This guy, John Mason, said, you know what? There is more to this stress equation than just this, you know, survival stressors that activate the stress response in the body. So he basically introduced the fact that emotional stress can trigger in the body through the same wiring, the same responses as the more, tradi more traditional uh, stress um, uh, factors. So that probably exp explains also the dramatic variability of the stress in each individual. Some people just, you know, Shake it off, I like that we had that in the morning. Somebody was playing, shake it off. They shake it off and they just going. They are wired, you know, to be more resilient. And some people catastrophize and they feel like the world is coming to an end if somebody on social media posted you are, you know, this and that and that. I don't have social media so I can comment on that. Don't want to know my Yelp rates. I don't want to know my Google. I said, if I'm a good doctor, I'll receive enough patients. So basically just, you know, shake it off. <laughs> so unfortunately, not always we can shake it off. And this is a very uh, major part of the burnout that uh, we have not just the initial stress of what we are doing in our work, but we have some factors that amplify the stress uh, in our bodies. And loss of control or predictability is a major one. So I think we just have to learn to live like the Romanians without a will and, you know, <laughs> we just <laughs> go one day at a time and say, thank you, Lord, I woke up this morning. And, and that was the first thing when I came to the United States to, uh, 20 years ago that struck me to my husband planning retirement. I'm like, what is that? I just want to survive today. <laughs> <laughs> so we are a society where we want to be in control and that is putting more stress on ourselves. Loss of outlets for frustration or sources of support is a major one. Can you go and punch somebody there? No, you need to smile and you need to be always in the best shape that you could be. So we need to find outlets for releasing the frustration. And the oriental cultures have Tai Chi, Qigong, breath work, meditation. Those are amazingly peaceful outlets for releasing the stress because we are with that stress in our body and we have to release that inflammatory cytokines, that cortisol and that adrenaline. Of course, exercise comes to mind as the best way to do that, but when do you have time to cram half an hour of exercise. I'm still struggling to, to walk 30 minutes every day. But that's definitely a good outlet. And also catastrophizing, perception that things are getting worse. Don't be a catastrophizer because that's definitely putting you at risk for burnout. So burnout, another thing I have not learned in medical school, but I have learned it as practicing physician and experiencing myself, it's when you have been extended beyond your resources. And you are emotionally exhausted. You don't feel that you know who you are anymore. You know, you need to juggle 20 heads during the day. You need to be the mother, the, you know, physician, the colleague, the employer, uh, and so on, so on. So uh, that's, that's a major one. Last drop in a full glass, I always call them when people come and say, you know, I don't know what, that, uh, what brought this disease on. I'm sorry, here it is, the glass was full before you had the last drop that you are pointing out. It has been piling for decades and you don't feel worthy. So loss of feeling of personal accomplishment. When I heard the Mandy here giving all this introduction, I was like, what she's talking about? Is that me? So we need to take, we need to take, we need to, you know, uh, feel worthy. So uh, about 50% of practicing physicians, I don't know in your fields, but experience burnout, one in two, that's very frightening because we are all patients in our own ter uh, term. You go there and you have a burnout physician, definitely you won't get good answers. 
And uh, there is strong association between burnout and suicidal ideation. <laughs> and I didn't know this until I made this presentation, but it's very scary. Female physician, one of the highest um, uh, at risk for uh, suicide, committing suicide. So 2.27 to general female population. So that is pretty sobering data. But we have good news. After I brought you down with all of this science that it looks terrible, we have this, again, wired in, adapting stress response in our body. But we can be in charge of it. Although autonomic nervous system, it's what I told you, the automatic pilot, we can take the seat. We can be the driver's seat and we can be in charge. So we have surprising power over our body. Somebody quoted, uh, or it was in the TED talk, uh, Marianne Williamson, that said that our biggest fear is to recognizing that we have that power. And we do have that power. And we can reduce the stress, we can increase the resilience, improve mood, enhance quality of life. And it's not my talk today to give that tools to you, but Mandy has amazing speakers coming and giving you those tricks. I couldn't stop not to give you a little science about that because uh, that's what I like to do, I guess. Oxytocin, the happy hormone, is being stimulated by social interactions and by warmth and touch. So a spa treatment, good touch, social interactions, all release this hormone that will decrease the anxiety, reduce the blood pressure, increase the pain threshold, so counteract all that nocive uh, effect of the stress. Also, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, that it's, again, in the yin and yang, the one that you want to activate uh, will basically counteract the inflammation triggered by the sympathetic nervous system and cortisol. And how do you activate the parasympathetic nervous system? As simple as taking a deep breath. <sighs> that really activates the parasympathetic nervous system. There is a breath that I love to do. It's called 478. If you Google it, Dr. Andrew Weil has that 478. You inhale for four, hold seven, exhale for eight. That long exhalation activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Warm words actually make us feel warmer and more connected to the world, so be kind. You heard how life-changing of, of an experience, it's a warm word for the person, but also for ourselves. That's what the science shows, that compassion actually boosts your own resilience. Um, and, you know, lowers the blood pressure, cortisol, everything. So even having a picture of a familiar person or somebody you love is proof to decrease your level of pain and increase the resilience. So we are wired also with a relaxation response in the body. And if you want to look at this TED talk, it's a fantastic one by Dr. Herbert Benson. So he is the Harvard professor that uh, founded the Mind Body Institute and he measured 40,000 genes activities and their expression in people that do a form of relaxation. And he actually coined just like CLA in 36 coined the stress response, the, it took almost 100 years, the relaxation response. And how do we activate the relaxation response? Again, from the oriental traditions, repetition of a word or a motor activity. So when you walk there, that's activating the relaxation response. When you pray, when you are repeating a mantra, when you are meditating or doing mindfulness, that's activating the relaxation response. And that leads to, as you can see here, uh, better resilience to oxidative stress, even at the cellular level, decreasing inflammation, and also enhancement of mood, quieter mind, decreasing negative emotions, enhancement of creativity, which we all want in the positions we are. And these are some quick, you know, uh, methods and tools to activate the relaxation response, breath work, yoga, mindfulness, and exercise. So in closing here, this is my prescription for the right living. 
and it is taken from Paramahansa Yogananda, who says right eating, right thinking, what that might be, and exercise. And when he talks about right eating, he also talks about not what we put in our food, but also about our mental diet. It consists usually of the thoughts that you are thinking, as well as the thoughts that you are receiving from the close contact with your friends and colleagues, I would add. So try to be with those that bring out the best in you, not the stress in you. And try to play and laugh. My son, when he was five, told me he doesn't want to grow up. And I was like, wow, is that a good thing? We all want that our kids to be little and cuddly. And I said, why is that? Am I such a bad role model? He said, mommy, you are not playing. You are just working. And that was my moment of transformation when I had to kind of revisit what I have been doing and change a little bit the path. That's why it's hard for me to have a path for life because I have been changing and steering depending on how I have been learning. So I don't know where I'm going, but I know this for sure. I like to listen with the ears of tolerance and see through the eyes of compassion and speak with the language of love. And that is my niece with her friend at the health fair in kindergarten, so we are making progress. We are teaching our little ones to take better care of ourselves, of themselves, but we need to take care of ourselves for them to be doing a good job. And in closure, and I looked through a Marshall book and I saw that gratitude is the attitude and positivity and thankfulness uh, gives you good benefits for health. I am Thankful to my colleague, gastroenterologist, Dr. Christine Tillich, who gave me um, uh, some of the scientific data that I presented. I love sharing. She does a lot of cool research to show how this gut microbiota influences our brain, looks at with functional MRIs of the brains. If you eat yogurt, how your brain is happier. And of course, I want to uh, thank to my patients who are teaching me every day the most amazing lessons of resilience and inspire me and challenge me in my work and my personal growth. And to thank to Mandy who brought me here today and uh, my colleague Christina who was too kind to give me such a nice opportunity to be here with you. And uh, I know I'm here uh, because probably I need to take uh, uh, on some leadership that I was always afraid of. <laughs> but today I learned that, you know, I'm a leader anyway. <laughs> and uh, I thank you for being here.